Today, we have uh, not one, but two speakers. Um, if you saw our information on the website, it highlighted Chuck Labelzik, uh, who's a vector ecologist at the Maine Medical Center Research Institute. Uh, but he's going to be joined as well by Molly Meager, who is a um, field technician for the lab and also a USM environmental science student uh, who's been working in her position since 2019. And as we were chatting earlier, told me that she loves ticks. So I'm interested in hearing <laughs> both her and Chuck's perspectives uh, today on their tick uh, research as well as other research that they conduct. So um, I'm going to mute everybody. This is being recorded just so folks know and I'm going to hand it off to Chuck and Molly. Okay. Thanks Suzanne. Um, I guess we can pull up. Molly's actually the is technologically more savvy than I am apparently so she's going to be the navigator for the presentation today. Um, but Yes, yeah, so our lab at the Maine Medical Center works on uh, vector-borne disease issues, which are issues dealing with ticks and mosquito-borne diseases. Um, we have been using uh, the sites or the different areas of the Wells Reserve uh, going back almost since the founding of the lab, going back to 1990 or so, uh, when we first began doing um, tick surveillance. And then since 2000, have incorporated mosquito surveillance into our general program uh, since the appearance of West Nile virus in, in the U.S. Um, and so it's not uncommon to see us down helping with bird banding, where we're taking birds um, that are being misnetted and, and taking the ticks off. And then we also have a longstanding program of doing small mammal work, where we're capturing, live capturing, um, a lot of small mammals and looking at tick burdens. So uh, I do want to thank everyone for, for uh, chiming in today. And so in New England, um, we actually have uh, 11 to date, 11 tick-borne tick infections that we consider uh, as human um, public health or to some extent veterinary health issues. Um, we have four major ticks that we regard as vectors of these pathogens. Uh, so of course, the black-legged or deer tick, which you can see on that top line on the right, is, is our, probably our most important tick from a medical or veterinary perspective. It is the vector of things such as Lyme disease, um, there was a relapsing fever, Borrelia miyamotoi, uh, babesiosis, which is caused by a parasite, Babesia microti, which is a red blood cell parasite. Uh, we have Anaplasma phagocytophilum, and then we have um, a, a virus, an encephalitis virus related to Powassan virus called deer tick virus. American dog ticks are probably our most common and abundant tick, however, and these in Maine are not uh, vectors of disease. They certainly are down south and out going out towards the, the Rocky Mountain uh, central parts of the U.S., but in Maine, they're really just a nuisance species, um, and they are a nuisance because they appear in a very short season from the end of April through the first half of July, and when they appear, they appear in massive numbers uh, for their very short season. Uh, this year in particular was particularly horrendous for them with the numbers of the dog ticks uh, that we're finding during our surveys just off the charts statewide. Uh, Lone Star ticks are a tick that is a southern evolved tick uh, tends to occur naturally from areas of Virginia south down to uh, northern Mexico. Uh, so it's a very much a warm climate associated tick. However, in recent years, it's been making inroads into New England. Um, a few years ago, it was discovered in outlying areas of southern Connecticut. Uh, a couple years later, it was found along the coast of Massachusetts and, and seems to be making its way increasingly every year a little further north. And so this is a tick that we have found through research that it actually is able to overwinter, at least in our coastal areas, in low numbers, um, based on some very preliminary data that we have. But it is one that we think will eventually, at some point, make its way into Maine. Uh, and it is a vector of several pathogens, including some arboviruses, as well as um, some bacterial infections that you see listed here. And then finally, a tick that's a little bit more uncommon uh, it's certainly on the landscape, widely dispersed, but isn't encountered as much by people as the woodchuck tick. Uh, this is a tick that, although it is found, as the name suggests, on woodchucks, um, we also see it a lot on several species of carnivores, uh, including things like striped skunks, as well as some of our members of the weasel, other members of the weasel family, such as fisher um, or long-tailed weasels or mink. 
And the scientific name for the black-legged tick is Ixodes scapularis. And it is known commonly as the black-legged or deer tick, uh, deer tick because it's strongly associated with the presence of white-tailed deer in a lot of landscapes. So there's two different roles that mammals play as hosts for ticks. Uh, firstly, there's the tick production, which is quite literally the reproduction of the tick. The adult female tick requires a blood meal. She digests that blood and produces eggs, um, some larvae hatch, and those larvae are not infected with any pathogens, uh, tick-borne pathogens. So, but we tend to know that the, the source of the blood meal is from larger mammals, such as deer, bear, moose, uh, and humans, as we all know. And the adult ticks do not feed on your smaller, you know, mice, shrews, squirrels. Um, and as I said, the uninfected larvae need to go get infected on mainly mice, uh, we think, and shrews, rabbits. And although the larvae can feed on deer and cats um, and birds, it's less common. And we see ticks as an emerging public health concern in New England, especially with range expansion. So this is our black-legged tick distribution. Um, I believe these maps are, yeah, from 1990 to 2009. So as you can see, back in 1990, we had a very small uh, tick submission. Of, I should say, this is from our passive tick surveillance program that occurred at our lab from 1989 to 2013. Since then, the University of Maine Cooperative Extension has taken that over. Um, but this is our data here. And up to 2009, you can see they've at least made their way um, to southern and parts of central Maine as well. And if we looked at a map from today, it'd be even further north. Yeah, and, and just to throw in one quickly, one quick um, item. So with our, part of our work um, is that we work with the state of Maine, the Maine CDC, our, our state health department, on looking at, at surveillance, trying to look at, at data from every county of Maine where ticks and, and to a lesser extent mosquitoes are present. And in, in northern Maine, in areas of Arista County and in down east Maine, we are seeing areas like Jackman, um, Presque Isle, Fort Kent, uh, and also some areas around Eastport where the ticks are just getting started. And, and as many of you know, who go to uh, areas outside in coastal New York County, that is not uncommon to be able to go out in the woods, especially in the fall, and encounter quite a few numbers of ticks in a very short period of time if you're in the right habitats. Um, but if we can take an hour of time in Presque Isle or Jackman, we make them up with one single tick for that hour of effort, as a contrast to areas in York, Wells, Scarborough, Freeport, where that same amount of effort will, will produce sometimes 50, 60, 70. So I think it tells us that we still have some area to go geographically in Maine uh, where those ticks are expanding their ranges. Um, and so those areas down the road, I'm sure we'll see an increase in ticks uh, as time goes by. And so with, with the rise of ticks, there's always some questions of why. And so if you were to look at the landscape in Maine and other parts of New England 100 years ago, it was all pretty barren. You know, it was all active agriculture, with very little and, and very restricted areas of, of actual what we would think of as, as older growth or, or mature forest land. Um, much of it had been cleared. And this stands in contrast to the pre-colonial era where it, it's, it's been regard or remarked that you could walk for days under a single tract of forest and not come across settlements or, or find any breaks in the forest canopy. Uh, however, with colonial periods starting, there was of course a rise in agriculture and that meant fewer forests, which then in turn meant fewer larger mammals, including deer as well as, as many of the, the predators that would feed on deer, such as wolves or mountain lions. Um, However, we are seeing now that that is changing back, and obviously Maine is one of the most heavily forested states in the country. We also have increased development, which is in, in, impinging upon our forest land with a lot more recreational use. People are spending a lot more time recreating outside, whether it's hiking, biking, fishing, hunting, walking, running, um, you know, and, and we're doing a lot of things outside that are exposing us or having us come into contact with ticks. 
And while this is going on, we are seeing as well that there is an increase in our overall deer herd. Our deer population um, is really in the Northeast, especially rebounding back from historic lows that occurred during the colonial period to the point that in some areas of, of the country, uh, deer are becoming an, a, a pest management issue, um, require active management more than just the traditional hunting season to, to curb uh, the numbers. And so with um, ticks and Lyme disease, what we have is, is kind of that cycle that Molly was talking about with, with we have different roles for, for wildlife. And very briefly, looking at a calendar year, if you look at this graph, um, number one of the eggs, the eggs of ticks are laid sometime during the springtime, middle to late spring, as soon as things begin to thaw out. Those ticks, however, uh, those eggs will stay under the leaf litter as eggs until about in Maine, we see the emergence of the larval ticks sometime around the middle of August or so. Those larval ticks emerge looking for a host to feed on and frequently become infected as a consequence, but they'll stay active all the way through the fall into the winter uh, where they then go into a hibernation phase to emerge towards the end of May, beginning of June as the life stage known as the nymph. And you can think of the nymph as the teenage life stage of the tick. It's also the life stage that causes the most cases of human Lyme disease. Um, these nymphs, however, in a traditional year, will be out for a very short period of time in late May, June, into July, generally tapering off, tapering off towards August to emerge out in the fall around the 1st of October as the adult and final life stage of the tick. Now, adult ticks are larger. They're about the size of an apple seed, and they are going to be out in the fall while the temperatures stay above an average daily temp of about 40 degrees or so. Uh, that means that if we have fairly mild falls and mild early winters, it's not uncommon to encounter ticks this time of year. Uh, and, and it's becoming more common to actually find ticks as you get closer to Christmas and New Year's. Uh, at one time back in the 90s, we could reasonably count on the tick season in the fall being done by about Veterans Day or at the very least Thanksgiving. That isn't as much the case anymore. You know, we're really seeing the extension with warming temperatures in the fall, tick season easily going into December, possibly January, especially in our coastal areas, and especially in southwestern coastal Maine as well. So, oh, did you want to add something? No, you can go. Yeah. Okay. So, um, we use wildlife studies to help us kind of navigate the, the unusual aspects of tick research can be kind of confusing and complicated sometimes. Um, but we do know that white-tailed deer are the dominant reproductive stage host for black wicket ticks. And like Chuck said, they are abundant in especially Maine. And if any of you are tuning in from Southern Maine, you, you know they're sort of a pest species. Um, and yeah, as you can see here, they kind of overlap. And so each deer can have up to 100 ticks at each time, at any given time. And the females on the deer can produce up to 3,000 um, eggs. So down here, you can see these are what the eggs look like. Um, these are some of the engorged females that might be getting ready to lay some eggs in the near future. And um, we don't often see infestation <laughs> this heavy on deer that we sample, but this is something that you know, could be a possibility. And so some of this work will, has led us into research that is actually translated actually into policy and wildlife policy in Maine. Yeah, and although I promise we are gonna to get to things like small mammals, uh, this is, you know, deer are, are part of the equation overall when we're looking at our research. And, and I bring up the slide because on a study that, that we worked on, one of the ideas of having the, the kind of the holy grail for deer research is to look at what what is the abundance of deer? You know, how many deer per square mile or per square kilometer do you need to reduce the population of deer to to actually see a break in the life cycle of ticks? And, and to our extent, to address this, we actually looked back in the 90s at various areas along the coast of Maine where we went out and sampled uh, deer abundance by counting uh, the scat the deer do. And, and there's a formula that you can do uh, based on the amount of sampling area where you can translate the amount of deer scat into a rough estimate of deer per square mile or per square kilometer. Uh, we then went and did our drag surveys looking for ticks. 
you know, we found that when the deer numbers get to be under 10 per square kilometer or around 12 per square mile, the number of ticks actually begins to drop off. And this is research that has been conducted also in areas like Connecticut and Massachusetts, and similar numbers have been found. So that certainly the, the lower end of, of the deer population abundance, um, you can actually have fewer, um, fewer amounts of ticks being on the landscape. Now, the flip side of that is that the higher your deer population, that means you can also see a higher population of ticks as a result. Um, and so to some extent, at least, uh, the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife has begun to incorporate issues such as Lyme disease into deer management policy uh, as well, which is sort of like the, the largest or the, the furthest extent actually of doing kind of work like this is to bring it into an area where it's actually gonna be used in a, in a public health solution. Uh, to, so to some extent, IFNW is working on, on harvest um, management recommendations to control or at least mitigate uh, issues of tick-borne disease in, in some parts of Maine. So this kind of brings us to the great debate. Um, is it the deer or is it the mouse? So we know mice is a reservoir host for our larvae and nymphs, as we talked about earlier. But we can also find these life stages on chipmunks, squirrels, especially red squirrels, um, and birds. And we're also kind of looking into the idea of feral cats as well. And this is a mouse that we sampled and you can kind of see pulling a larva off there. And these nymphs can get pretty engorged, so they're obvious to see. Um, they can get a pretty full blood meal and we find them mainly on the ears um, as well as the jaw and around the eyes, the tips. <laughs> and so again, with the, the deer, we see them as perhaps the sole critical wildlife host for our ticks. Um, but we find a lot of ticks on, as you may know, if you have pets, your dogs and your cats, um, and we see them on red fox as well. And um, we've recently partnered with some fur bearers in Maine, and we have gotten a lot of ticks off of coyotes, which has been um, an interesting development, I guess. Um, so we look forward to looking into that in the future. And so a lot of work previously has done work looking at how important deer are to other, other mammal species. Um, and so when we look at, at a lot of the early research, then the late 80s, early 90s, especially a lot of this was done in Massachusetts and Connecticut, we do find that even back then, deer were regarded as being much more important than animals like raccoons, opossums, or feral cats. Um, you know, and you can see from this table that the numbers are pretty, are pretty dramatically different. You know, um, you know, certainly the number of ticks per host on an average deer from the study published in 1990 showed close to 40 ticks per deer, where the next uh, highest was the opossum at 1.2 for common medium-sized mammals. Uh, and this drops then when you're looking at raccoons into under one tick per raccoon, and then a lot lower when you're looking at feral cats. Now, the interesting thing that came up in the last week, as Molly mentioned, we actually are working with some licensed fur trappers this year. One of them reported that even though he's been collecting uh, pelts from raccoons, he's not finding very high tick densities on those animals. And so it raises the question as to why. You know, it could be that they're exceptionally good at grooming the ticks off, which is a possibility. Um, we also, there's been some research to suggest that animals that are much more social, that is, they may exist in herds or in communal settings, in family groups, and there may be some uh, grooming that is conducted across members of a, of a group, um, may actually help to decrease um, the amount of ticks on an individual animal. Uh, and this may be one of the reasons why, for instance, our moose are so heavily parasitized by another species of tick, the winter tick in Northern Maine. Moose are fairly solitary, and so they don't have a lot of communal grooming that goes on among members of the species, unlike white-tailed deer, which actually do groom each other. And so there may be some of that going on that, that might reduce the tick numbers uh, to some extent. However, a recent paper, um, to bring it from 1990 to 2021, uh, there was a paper published this year out of Michigan, where they were looking at islands in the Great Lakes in Michigan. And these are islands without white-tailed deer present or white-footed mice present. <clears throat> and remember from what Molly mentioned, that white-footed you know, white mice are thought to be our 
our primary host for sub-adults or juvenile ticks, and white-tailed deer are our primary host for the reproductive or adult stage of the ticks. And in this study, they found that on islands where there were no deer or white-footed mice, the life cycle of ticks was completed in, in the presence of chipmunks and coyotes as backup hosts. Um, and so this was really, you know, kind of interesting to us because it really means that we, you know, we certainly, even though we talk about deer being important, and as some of you may know, I've been, you know, kind of in the forefront, at least in Maine, of talking about how important deer are, it does mean that we don't know everything we think we know. And, and even after working in this field for a few years, you know, you realize there are still things to discover and, and look into. Um, and I think that the study like this shows just how important it is that we need to be inclusive of looking at a lot of other wildlife species. And there probably are other species that are going to be very important um, in, in some of these ecological studies going forward. Oh, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> this is our <laughs> historical data of the small mammals that we've collected at the Wells Reserve. As you can see, just about half of our small mammal collections are the white-footed mouse, um, but we also get quite a few red-backed bulls as well as eastern chipmunks, and we see the occasional flying squirrel, shrew, and red squirrel as well. But our dominant species is definitely the mouse, and we see quite a high burden on them compared to the other species as well as ticks. And that actually does, to some extent, make us happy because um... Mice are pretty easy to handle, and we, we hate handling red squirrels. They're just very mean and ill-tempered at the best of times. And, they and have noisy, too. And noisy, too, yes. <laughs> so this is a data just kind of showing our, our kind of our relative rates of, of the four big species that we work with. Um, and you can see that what this data really tells us is that we certainly have years where we have a lot of activity, and we have years that are relatively quiet. And so, you know, the real years for us that stand out are years like 2011, where it wasn't just that we had a lot of mice, which you can see on this graph that the green bar representing white-footed mice tends to be pretty high across the board. But in 2011, there was something going on where we had a lot of mice, a lot of chipmunks, and a lot of voles present on the landscape. Uh, a similar year happened this year, actually, where we had a pretty high mouse population along with, with relatively high chipmunks and voles present on the landscape as well. Um, and a lot of this is governed by things such as weather, by seed crops, um, and, and by the reversal of fortune in, in relying on seed crops. Um, so for instance, in 2000, leading up to 2019, we had years where, you know, numbers were fairly respectable. Certainly there were mice, chipmunks, voles on the landscape. 2019 happened. And if you look at that year, you can see overall, those numbers are pretty low. And, and what we're seeing with that is that the numbers leading up to 2019, 13, 14, 15, 16, all had pretty robust numbers of our representative species. But then the winter of 2018 was harsher. There were fewer seed crops with pretty abundant rodents on the landscape. And so that overwintering populations of these animals just completely hit the ground. And they, they tanked out went into the cellar and they were very difficult to find very high numbers of any of our rodent species until the very end of the season. Um, so, you know, I think that we, we do work on these projects on the one hand because it's important for us to have a handle on what's being found on wildlife, but there's also a big push now for looking at, at what would be called long-term data. You know, these time series where we can monitor events that are happening on the ground over a large period of time, and some of it could be related to things like climate, but also tying in ideas such as seed crops, uh, looking at masting of oaks, for instance, um, can also help inform us about long-term changes that are going on um, on the landscape. And so, um, again, you know, the, the reason I bring up this slide is that uh, we have a bit of a color change in the graphs but as you can see, we certainly do have years that we have ups and downs. And one of the things I want to point out with this graph is that um, the high spikes we have for white-footed mice, but also the fairly consistent or relatively consistent numbers of eastern chipmunks that we have from this data. And so what we have noted is that in years when 
the, the white-footed mouse population may be lower, uh, there are years when the tick numbers seem to be doing just fine. And the tick numbers stay pretty consistent following some of these years when the white-footed mouse population crashes. And that may be because we have animals like chipmunks and red squirrels, which can actually take over for, for the mouse population uh, when, when it crashes out. And so the ticks kind of have a safety net in being able to find their way onto other species. And the other benefit for them is that chipmunks and red squirrels tend to be a lot longer lived than white-footed mice. Um, on average, white-footed mice, somebody up at the University of Maine once referred to mice as the sandwiches of the forest, you know, because they are a real big food base for a lot of other carnivore and predator species. <clears throat> and uh, an average lifespan of a mouse, if a mouse lasts a year in the wild, that's a pretty good run for a white-footed mouse. You know, there's an estimate that they maybe last about six months in the wild uh, before they're taken out of the system by a predator. Chipmunks and red squirrels tend to be a little bit longer lived and, and they are a little bit bigger in their body shape. Um, and because they also cache nuts and, and seed crops, uh, they may have the ability to kind of overwinter and withstand some of these fluctuations in, in seed production uh, that white-footed mice don't. Uh, but <clears throat> all of this is not just about mice or chipmunks or white-tailed deer. We are actually able in the last few years to do a lot more work with other animals. Um, and I'm just, we're gonna go over a little bit on some of these. Um, one that's been in the news a lot lately um, is the our only marsupial that occurs in, in the United States, uh, or at least the Northeastern United States, the Virginia opossum. And there's been um, one study that I'll highlight in a couple of slides from now, talking about how they are the great tick vacuums. But the issue with that one study coming out is that it got a lot of press in the New York Times and was kind of carried to the four winds like gospel. And so opossums made their way into the modern internet as a lot of memes. Um, and a lot of people regarded them as great vacuums and a great way to completely devour your ticks. And admittedly, opossums are kind of cute um, sometimes. They can be a little ill-tempered, but you know they're they're kind of cool otherwise. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's a lot of people out there that that we get calls about that people are always asking about how they can increase their possum numbers to kind of reduce their tick populations. And the study, which was put up by the Cary Institute, really looked at at sort of what are called ecological traps. So these are are places that ticks will find themselves onto hosts, and those are kind of dead end hosts. And their study was based on a very small sample size. Um, but the assumption that they made was that ticks end up, ticks with blood meals. So these are ticks that are, are kind of engorged end up becoming a meal for the opossums. Um, and so the, the great um, quote was that they're net destroyers of ticks. Uh, and this is a statement that again, made itself into the national media uh, and sort of captured a lot of attention about the possibility of, of possums as a uh, kind of a holy grail to kind of get rid of ticks on the landscape. And when you went on looking on opossum and ticks, you find there's a lot of hits from a lot of publications, um, some of which are actually just quoting this scientific study, um, but not really looking into too much depth on the study itself. And I kind of want to mention, you hear a lot of the same thing with uh, chickens as well. Yeah. Um, kind of the yeah. same idea, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That people think that, that chickens or possums, if you have a lot of them, are going to reduce your tick population. Um, two researchers, however, published a paper recently where they actually went into kind of a deep dive on the data for a lot of this. And, and they actually took a look and thought, you know, are Virginia possums really these ecological traps that they're made out to be? Um, and so they went and they tried to ground truth through uh, laboratory um, examination of captured Virginia opossums. And what they found was that by looking at the stomach contents of these Virginia opossums, um, and this was again a very small study based in Illinois, uh, they went through and exhaustively looked at for any sign of ticks or tick body parts in the stomach contents. They didn't locate any ticks or tick body parts in the stomach contents of the 32 Virginia opossums that they looked at. And this was, this was conducted, as I said, in Illinois, but in an area that was highly endemic for um, black-legged ticks 
and tick-borne disease. Um, so it would be an area that would be comparable to Cumberland or Kennebec County, Maine, um, in its in its in, um, endemic nature of these tick-borne pathogens. So you know, stuff was around in the landscape. And, and so this was kind of a ground truth thing of that original study, um, kind of refuting it to some extent. So I think it speaks to the need for really for folks to really look into the science um, behind some of this. Um, and, and really, especially with our, our social media presence nowadays, you know, it's very easy for information to be carried um, across a, a very large area, you know, without a whole lot of, of um, verifying the data uh, that people are presenting. And so a study that, that we conducted um, this year, we actually were able to collect Virginia opossums. And these animals right here are, are not dead. They are um, anesthetized, so they're unconscious. Um, and we are examining them for tick presence. And you can see that they host deer ticks as well as dog ticks very easily in the springtime. Um, the one thing I will note about the Virginia opossums is that depending where they are, um, these are even ticks that we pulled from a fairly urban area um, in Kennebec County not an area I would have thought of would have been great for ticks, given that it was on a fairly busy road in and around um, uh, almost an urban development with a lot of human debris in the area. Uh, not what I would have thought of as great deer, deer tick habitat, but certainly they were on the opossums in these areas. Um, and opossums, kind of an anecdotal thing, they actually take four times the anesthesia that skunks and raccoons of the same size take in order to knock them down. Um, and as Molly can attest to, we had one opossum that we collected once that we knocked it down. We're looking at it in the back of the truck. And then for those of you that don't know about opossums, they're marsupials. So they have a pouch that they keep their young in. And as this anesthetized female opossum was laying in the back of the truck, a couple of heads popped out of the pouch with a couple of tails. And that meant that I had to drag her around for eight hours while she recovered in the back of my truck, loaded in a blanket while she came out of her anesthesia. So... Always exciting. She did just, just fine though. She did just fine. Yeah, she was very happy when she got out, and, you know, but yeah. So we also tend to look at a lot of mustelids, which are the, the weasel family, as we like to refer to it. Um, and this is another skunk that's sedated. Um, and we see that they're possibly, or they are a suitable host for Ixodes cookii which is in the same genus as the, the black-legged tick, but it's known as the woodchuck tick. Um, it's commonly found in burrows for woodchucks. Um, so, but we know Ixodes cookii to be a vector of Powassan encephalitis, which is a very serious disease. And this kind of leads us to think about our skunk's reservoirs for these diseases or mustelage in general. Um, Excuse me. So we see that the, our winter harvested fishers are also suitable for cookie eye um, or the woodchuck tick. And you can kind of, this is a fisher down here. And uh, oh, this is an ermine that we collected. I believe that was, it was this summer. Um, and we pulled at least deer ticks off of it. I don't know about cookie eye per se, but um, and you can see that they kind of change color in the winter, which is pretty interesting. I think Chuck will talk about that maybe next. Oh, right. Uh, and so the other the other class of animal that we're we're kind of interested in looking at a little bit, and it, but it gets a little complicated, is the idea of lagomorphs, which are our our rabbits. <clears throat> and so Maine actually has only a couple of native species of lagomorphs. Uh, the first is is the snowshoe hare, and the snowshoe hare is generally not thought to be very important in, in the life cycle of deer ticks uh, or black legged ticks or the cycle of Lyme disease. Um, they tend to be associated a little bit more with more mature conifer habitats. And for instance, in York County, even though we don't see a lot at the reserve itself, there is a site fairly close by in Alfred, Maine, the Massabesic Experimental Forest, which is dominated by a lot of mature hemlock stands that our snowshoe hare populations do pretty well at. Um, the other lagomorph that is sort of in the ether a little bit that we kind of don't really encounter a whole lot, but we worry about encountering is the New England cottontail. And as many of you know, uh, the New England cottontail is our only uh, rabbit that is native to the area. So it's different from a hare, it's actually a rabbit. Um, 
but it is a, a, a species that is of concern because it is facing steep population declines. Um, and today they believe there's somewhere only around 13,000 uh, New England cottontails left in, in the northeastern U.S. And so with these New England cottontails, uh, the reserve, of course, is one of the sites where there is a, a, a population that has been augmented with individuals to kind of sustain or increase the overall population in New York County, uh, along with some sites near Portland in, in um, Cape Elizabeth, Maine. Uh, the biggest issue for it, however, is loss of habitat. Um, and ideally, what we would think of as um, kind of emergent or early successional forest is ideal cottontail habitat. Um, which of course the reserve has in, in abundance, um, but it has a fairly restricted range with really only, only very small localized populations um, being encountered. And from our purposes, we actually have a concern because if we are doing work with other or targeting other species such as skunks um, or, or woodchucks, we do have a concern that we would like to not collect live uh, New England cottontail. Uh, they're apparently fairly um, sensitive to handling and, and they have what would be called capture myopathy fairly quickly. That is, they could succumb um, to even, even gentle handling and, and could possibly die from the stress of, of an encounter. So we really try our best to not uh, catch New England cottontails, if at all possible, um, even though we are, we are recognizing that they are on the landscape, especially at, at the reserve. Now these ticks though, are these animals, uh, both hares, the snowshoe hare and the New England cottontail probably, have a tick uh, that is a native tick called the rabbit tick. The scientific name is Haemophysalis leporis palustris. And of course the name leporis, of course, is, um, means rabbit. Um, it, this tick is common and widespread across the United States. Uh, however, as you can see from the slide on the left, it can get to hyperabundant numbers on individual lagomorphs. And although there is not in general a lot of health issues associated with that overabundance, it can cause, especially on the ears, um, a lot of modeling of the tissue and can have immune responses that result in a lot of the tissue scabbing and crusting over, um, in indicating a loss of fur. Now, usually this animal will recover by the time winter hits. Um, so there's not generally an issue with issues like frostbite, but at least during the summertime, it can be pretty unsightly. And I'm sure uncomfortable itself for the animal, even though there's not a lot of long-term impact um, from these infestations. And so, of course, as Molly mentioned, um, you know, these are, are some animals that have changes in color. Um, the snowshoe hare, of course, goes from a morph where it is a brown pelage in the summertime to a, uh, its, its typical white or grayish phase in the winter. Uh, similar things happen to some of our weasels, especially our short tail weasel, Mustela erminia, and our long tail weasel, Mustela frenata, will go to a white morph in, in the wintertime. Uh, and at one time, this was actually an evolutionary advantage because with a lot of dense snow cover, these animals would blend in better into the population. But as you can see from the top photo on the left, um, you know, this is what happens when climate change happens and we don't have the snow cover that we've traditionally had. Uh, meaning these animals actually show up on the landscape a whole lot easier now and, and could possibly result in, in larger uh, incidents of predation on, from hawks and owls uh, during this time. So some cl conclusions that we can make is that uh, we can't make too many conclusions. The jury is still out. So there hasn't been enough research done with some of our carnivores that we see like foxes and coyotes to say with certainty that they can affect our ticks and tick-borne diseases on the landscape. Um, there tend to be some cryptic species. They're hard to capture or we're unable to capture them. Um, and that can kind of make making those connections a little more difficult, but hopefully with future research, we can work on that. And uh, this top picture up here, as we mentioned, we are partnering with some fur bearers. These are some of the ticks that we had just gotten in. And if you can see this vial right here, I believe this was off of a coyote. So this vial is at least halfway full with ticks. Um, so you can see a pretty high burden on, and you know, there, I think this one was for a red fox. Um, so they definitely are feeding 
on these animals. It's just a, a matter of, you know, pulling it all together and kind of connecting this data, I guess. Um, so yeah, some early work with carnivores in the 80s um, showed the, the adaptations that these carnivores can have to the human uh, environments. And this can also <laughs> lead to the appearance of some new ticks that were always on the look for uh, here is the Asian longhorn tick. Um, excuse me, sorry, I'm getting a little messed up here. But anyways, the, the real driver that we're looking for is how do these ticks play into the human or veter veterinary diseases? Um, and like I said, we have some limitations, but hopefully with future research, we can work on that. Um, yeah, and, and just a, a quick, uh, an aside, so this new tick <clears throat> that we don't yet have in Maine, the Asian longhorn tick, is one that's gotten some press the last couple of years um, because it, it was thought to be imported from Asia, possibly on, on livestock. But unlike black-legged ticks, which seem to do very well in a forested habitat, the Asian longhorn tick does very well in what we would consider to be waste habitats. So areas that are urbanized, areas with a lot of open soil, not a whole lot of dense vegetation. Um, and as a consequence, they are also very happy to get on hosts that have adapted to that environment. So for instance, um, in New York City and in Staten Island, which is pretty built up, it's pretty urban, uh, raccoons are turning out to be probably the most important host for these ticks in, in the area and not white-tailed deer and not mice. Um, so I think that it means that we really do need to you know, now that we've done a lot of work on mice and deer, we, we need to really need to start thinking about a lot of these other um, mammals that are around on the landscape. And especially if they're cryptic, that we don't know how many are out there uh, because, you know, they, they hide. They're very good at, at non-detection. Um, you know, I think it's important for us to, to start to look into that. And for us, as exciting as it is and as fun as it is, you know, we, we have to realize that we're working with these animals, be it the smallest white-footed mice or, you know, the largest, angriest, aggressive fisher snapping its jaws at us. You know, it is, it is a privilege to actually work with these animals. And, and so as a consequence, we actually have to do quite a bit of training to do that. Uh, we work very closely with our IACUC, which is our Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, and um, you know, the IACUCs for agents for organizations are usually a standing committee that is mandated by federal law. So both the USDA and the National Institutes of Health are on board um, kind of overseeing animal care and use at a particular institution. Now, although in most cases, this is in regards to laboratory science and laboratory testing or work with animals, it does also come across in, in the wildlife field as well. Um, and it really, the IACUC is there <clears throat> to really ensure that the animals being worked on are being um, studied in a very humane and ethical way. And as Chuck was kind of mentioning, we do quite a bit of training um, to work with these animals. We've both taken, um, I've taken one chemical mobilization course and I know Chuck's taken many over the years. Um, and we also have our IACUC training. And as we were talking about the New England cottontails earlier, we try to avoid as best as we can. And I believe we have so far. Um, we don't want to work with endangered species. We'd rather, um, the animals come first, basically, is what it comes down to. Uh, the research is secondary. And, and, oh. and I guess I will say the other thing is that, you know, there is a lot of um, training and care that goes in, especially if we're using uh, chemical immobilization. To, to work with animals. Uh, you know, these are animals that may be already stressed when they're captured. <clears throat> and so injecting them with a, a sedative um, or a compound that will um, uh, kind of depress their activity, you know, we do have to keep and monitor them and make sure they don't overheat or in the colder months um, become hypothermic. Um, and so they are cared for while they're in the field. And we, we always make sure that the animals are coming out of sedation and are fully mobile before we bring them back to the site of capture as well. So we don't have any um, accidental issues of them wandering into a road or coming into someone's yard where they may be thought to be diseased or, or injured, so. And I guess we can open it up for questions. Yeah, if, if we have time. If we have time, which I think we do.
We've got a couple minutes. So Molly, why do you love to Um, I was kind of talking before everybody logged on. Um, my favorite part of working with ticks is kind of seeing, it's a really good way to see a Snapchat, a snapshot of all of ecology. Um, so we get to work with a lot of wildlife and we get to see the interactions and we get to see, you know, how a mice who a mouse who has a small range um, that might keep a tick-borne pathogen in a small area versus with the deer that have a larger range that might affect you know our Lyme disease prevalence and kind of just seeing those things day to day is really really cool and interesting um, and also I just love wildlife in general and uh, ticks tend to be on just about everything so bad for them good for me. Uh, so there's a question that natural sprays work against ticks. Um, so <clears throat> there's some good news and some bad news about that. So um, the good news is that if applied correctly, they do natural sprays, AKA sprays that are derived from a botanical compound, do work to some extent against black-legged ticks. Um, however, the efficacy is not great. Um, I think a recent study that was published in 2019 or 20 out of the University of Rhode Island took a look at the current state at the time of a lot of natural compounds that were on the market. And when applied at the recommended levels and concentrations, they found that on average, maybe 20 to 30% control of black legged ticks um, happened with a lot of these natural compounds. And that's, of course, going across the board. Some, such as a lot of the cedar oils, didn't work at all. Uh, while others that were, you know, kind of a rosemary wintergreen based may have had as much as 35 to 40 percent efficacy. Um, and that is a little bit different than what the state of research was back before 2008. And so those of you that remember the economic downturn that happened in 08, uh, there actually were several small chemical companies that went out of business at that time. And, and some of them were actually companies that produced botanical compounds that were not able to be reproduced because of licensing issues. Um, and so the state of the industry back a decade ago uh, for natural products was actually a little bit better than it stands today, actually. Um, so they do work to some extent, but uh, again, not as great as we would hope. And the flip side is that if you're talking about dealing with dog ticks, boy, they're like the Uber tick. They, they can shrug off a lot. And so a lot of the natural compounds just don't even don't even make a dent in the dog tick populations. Um, so I have a question. I'm curious. Um, why is it that ticks seem to prefer some animals and not others, mm -hmm. and even some humans and not others? Do they are they attracted to their host by like a sense of smell, or what determines yeah. Where they land. So it, it's kind of weird because, for instance, um, there is a type of tick that is found only on weasels, mink, and fisher. Um, and this is a type of tick that is, is and no matter where you go, and, and admittedly, a lot of people don't see it because they don't work with these animals. Um, but even though this tick is probably around, and, and probably encounters raccoons and other animals, we just don't find it on them. So whether it's a, it's a question of being evolved to a certain chemical that's off gas from a host, you know, certain ticks are probably attracted to those. Uh, there was somebody a long time ago that talked about how, if you look at a tick under a microscope, it actually has a lot of hairs on it. And the prevailing thought way back in the 30s and 40s was that the, the way the hairs are positioned on a tick body uh, it's actually evolved to be able to navigate through the hairs of its particular hosts. So it kind of makes it, and I don't know if that's really held up as much anymore because we certainly see with, with black legged ticks that, you know, they're pretty, they, they have a pretty wide host range, you know, and, and other ticks actually don't, you know, other ticks don't have as much of an interest in getting on people. Um, 
And uh, yeah, it, it's kind of interesting. I think a lot of it probably has to do with chemistry. You know, there probably is some kind of chemistry that's, that's given. I know with mosquitoes, um, you know, there is a definite link with diet uh, that can occur certainly. And it's actually been shown that people who have a lot more beer in their diet um, actually are um, more attractive to mosquitoes, which just kills me. That crushes me, Suzanne, it really does. Um, so there may be, there may be a whole lot of things that we don't even know about, but, but I'm sure diet, um, and certainly personal chemistry is, is a factor, you know, as well. Yeah. And the way that ticks tend to find their host is, uh, this thing called, I think it's a Haller's organ yep. and it's located on the top. It's the front of their legs. So if you ever see ticks kind of like sticking out their legs, um, it's something that we call questing when they're looking for a host. And they can use that howler's organ to detect CO2, uh, temperature, and humidity as well. So that's kind of like how they find their host to begin with. Um, and there's a, a question about DEET efficacy. So DEET, um, DEET comes in a bunch of different concentrations. So you can get it from, I believe, the lowest is 10% up to 100%. And with a lot of studies that have been conducted, at least against mosquitoes, they have found that when the DEET concentration is at around 28%, that is the most optimal concentration that you need uh, for protection. Um, anything more than that is just excess. Anything less, you, you see a, a, a decline in efficacy um, and you need to apply it more often. So if you're aiming to buy DEET, um, you know, certainly look at around a 28% concentration on the, lab, on the can. Um, can you get ticks from mice in your house? Well, you know, you possibly could. Um, however, there's a couple of questions, a couple of things with that. One, uh, ticks do dry out pretty easily. And so a lot of us, our homes are actually pretty dry. And so there isn't a whole lot of issue with um, ticks on mice surviving once they fall off the mouse in a house. Uh, they, they will probably dry out and desiccate. However, the flip side is that there are reports of people who have cabins where squirrels, skunks, woodchucks have absolutely inundated these seasonal cabins. Um, and once the cabins are closed up for the year, these animals come in and essentially den inside of it. There have been reports of when people come in at the beginning of the spring, clear out the cabins of wildlife, um, the ticks then start looking for hosts and have made their way and people find that the, the couch cushions that had a squirrel nest inside of them are now find ticks crawling out of their couch cushions in their, in their camps. So, you know, there is, it's not a, a definite one way or another, uh, but certainly, you know, I think that the real take home is that you want to try to avoid having those animals in your house as much as possible, I think. Um, do sprays work in the yard and they hurt other animals? Well, the, a lot of the synthetic sprays do work uh, to reduce tick, tick burden uh, and tick abundance in your yard. However, you don't have to spray your entire yard. It's, it's generally thought that really like a six foot barrier around the wood edge is gonna be sufficient um, to take out ticks where you're probably gonna encounter them the most. But a lot of these synthetics will hurt other non-targets. So certainly other pollinators um, you know, potentially dragonflies, things like that. If they land where the sprays have been laid down, they certainly can be impacted from, from those treatments. Any other questions? Feel free to unmute yourself or type in the chat. And we, we didn't show pictures of our fingers after a red squirrel or a weasel sinks their teeth into them. Um, but, you know, there is a potential. I'm actually going to try, Suzanne. Oh, let's see. You cannot share screen. Oh, I see. All right. Um, so, yeah, I was going to try to share um, the video, which I'm going to try and assume is here. Oh, you should have share screen capabilities. Is it telling okay. you you don't? Yeah, that's okay. Um, yeah, we just had the video I was going to mention to you earlier um, that I can actually send you if you want to put it. You can actually put it up somewhere if you want. Um, but I think I, I might have sent a copy of it to Lynn as well at one point. Uh, the the weasel that we encountered down on the boardwalk a few months ago. So yeah, I'll um, check. I'll make you a co-host. Maybe that will help. Okay. And Molly and Chuck, while you're doing that, what about turkeys? You didn't mention them. Do they because they groom each other? Do they not pick up ticks? Yeah, you know, the turkey question, 
So here's the problem we've had with turkeys. They, we don't have a lot of access to be able to go out and, and get them live. And the hunting season tends to occur in the fall when the juvenile ticks are not in the landscape. And then in the springtime before the juvenile ticks actually come out. So it, it, turkeys are a big question. We don't really know. Um, and there's been a lot of debate back and forth. And I think what we really need to do is we just need to get sit down and, and see if we can examine a few during kind of the peak summer season, you know, June, July, um, and examine some and just see, because I think it's, it's really one of those species that I would be surprised if they weren't involved. Um, but I don't think the data is there yet to, to really say uh, one way or another. What is the, um, what's the ultimate goal of your research? What, is there one question you're trying to answer? Well, you know, I think one of the issues that we want to look at is, um, you know, with, with the wildlife work in particular, um, we tend to find that the wildlife work gives us data that we don't have from, um, doing our tick drags and from things like a surveillance program where people send their ticks in for identification to like a lab. Um, in a lot of cases, the, the numbers and the, the, the population trends of ticks on host tend to be a little bit more consistent, you know, they're maybe not as affected by drought as much. Um, and, uh, you know, they also provide us with an opportunity to look for new tick species that may be coming in to the area you know, which I think is certainly a, a definite possibility. Um, you know, I think that, uh, especially with the long-term data that we have, um, you know, it's, it's very good for looking at issues related to climate change, because I think you can't do a lot of climate change research with just one or two years worth of data. You know, having these long-term data sets that go, um, you know, we now we have, God, almost, I was looking at, I was, I was shocked that it's close to 30 years of mammal trapping data at the reserve. I was astounded by that, um, actually, because it really does, you, we've been doing it for so long, you don't even really re, you know, realize that you've been doing it for 30 years now. You're like, wow, I've tripped over the same Barbary bush for 30 years. Isn't that amazing? You know? Um, I think so. another important aspect is, um, as Chuck was talking about during the actual talk, there's been a ton of research on tick burden on mice and deer, but doing this kind of work also allows us to maybe check out the, the overlooked species that may be perpetuating these tick-borne pathogens that, you know, we don't really know for sure yet because there hasn't been too much research done um, quite yet. Yeah, and, and I think especially with the, the idea of the, um, the bird work, which we didn't cover in this talk at all, but the bird work certainly you know, it's also important because we, we do see, and I'm pretty sure we haven't done a deep dive into the data yet, but I would be very surprised if we, we don't see changes over this time period, again, close to 30 years, in um, the kinds and different species of birds that, that were present 30 years ago. It'd be interesting to look and see if the diversity has changed at all over that time as habitat and, and you know, landscape uh, epidemiology has changed at the reserve. You know, certainly the woods look a lot different than, than they did 30 years ago in some areas. And, um, you know, I'd be surprised if that didn't reflect itself in, in you know, kind of the bird species that we see as well. All right, Chuck, were you able to find that video? No, or? it doesn't okay. seem to want to come through. It's, it's, I guess it's a pretty big file, so it's a video file, so it's it got some meat to it, so. Okay. Yeah. Well, it looks like it's a couple minutes after one, so we'll wrap up. But thank you, thank you, Molly and Chuck, for yeah, sharing your, your research with us and your wisdom on ticks and love and enthusiasm for them. Amazing. Cool. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Happy holidays, everybody. Yeah, you too. Thanks, guys.